Uh, our next speaker is John D4. Uh, oh, I think I'm losing this one. Energy. Energy crisis. This one works. Like most emirs, John loves to experiment. He's a very talented builder of all kinds of RF applications. But he has one big problem. His garden is too small. But John is not easy to put off if he wants to achieve something. So he just started to do EME with a small dish. And that worked so well that he now is active on five bands. The only thing he now needs to concentrate on is a coefficient he calls the XSC. He will explain. <laughs> Go ahead, John. I'll tell you. I have absolutely no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> you will have later. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, very nice to be here. I last did a talk in, in Cambridge, um, and uh, I, I, always, I always feel slightly intimidated at these things because there are guys here who've been doing EME since before, oh. Oh. Since before I was born. But um, I'm pretty new to it. Um, and there's a few people to blame, and I'll, I'll explain those at the end. But I've called this thing multum in parvo. Now, 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 multum in parvo is Latin, which uh, means good things come in small packages. But, but it's also the um, it's also the motto of the smallest county in England, Rutland. As you drive across the, the uh, border, you see this sign sign that says Rutland. And then it says Multum in Parvo. And then 30 seconds later, you, you see another sign that says Leicestershire, <laughs> because it's such a small county. So um, I, I thought I'd use that as a title. Um, small dish EME. Well, backyard moon bounce has been done to death at conferences, um, mainly American conferences. Um, the difference between my ideas of small dish EME and backyard yard moon bounce is my backyard's not the size of Vermont. Most Americans have backyards the size of Vermont as far as I can make out. And their idea of small dish EME, um, the presentations normally start with uh, get your three and a half meter XTVRO dish and put it in your backyard. If I was to do that, two things would happen. One, the I'd have the neighbours knocking on the door, and two, my wife would be getting in her car and leaving. <laughs> but, but she's actually very tolerant. I chose to do uh, microwave EME. I've never done two meter EME, too much noise. I've never done VHF EME. I like microwaves because it's a challenge. And as you probably know, I write the microwave column in, in uh, uh, Radcom as well. Microwave EME with a 15 wavelength dish is an even bigger challenge. So, as, as Jan said, I do like a challenge. I'm in this hobby to learn things. The great thing about, about this hobby is you can be surrounded by people who are professional engineers, um, consultants, everything else, and you learn stuff from them. It costs you nothing. That's the wonderful thing I love about about, about this hobby. And since I started in 2010, I, I've only been at this game for, se for, for seven and a half years. Uh, but I've learned so much about systems, about microwaves, um, and about antennas. This, this was my fir first attempt. G4HJW gave me this. It's a 1.4 metre spun aluminium dish. And I, I kept seeing it in his back garden in the corner, covering grass. And I said, one day I said, said uh, Bernie, can I have that? And he said, yeah, of course you can. So I, I took it away and I thought, right, well, I can do moon bounce now. I've got a dish. <laughs> it cost me nothing. It's small enough to pick up and carry. And I started off on 13 cents. I went through a load of calculations with VK3UM's uh, software. I must have spent months looking at this. And I came to the conclusion that the best band to start on to get some results was 2320. Two things uh, went towards that. One, um, this dish was just about big enough. And two, somebody gave me an amplifier that would do 250 watts. 
on, on 13 cents. So that gave me a start. I started off with a square septum feed. Um, somebody said put a pie dish on the end of it. And I thought it was spelt P-Y-E, but I actually put, uh, put the thing on. And I didn't really try, uh, uh, try and optimise it. I put a choke, choke ring on it. I put um, a simple uh, uh, polar mount on it. And it worked. The problem was, everybody said, what a fantastic signal for a small dish. And I said, pardon? <laughs> um, I very rapidly realised that when you have a small dish and lo lots of power, you, you become an alligator. Big mouth and small ears. Um, and I didn't really understand this, this because not being a moonbound, so I thought, well, surely it's all to do with the gain of your dish and, you know, small gain, same on transmit and receive. I used to teach my students about, the, uh, about reciprocity and all this sort of thing. But then someone, it probably was Sam, started talking, uh, talking to me about noise and pickup and dish illumination. And um, so I, I very rapidly started to understand a little bit more, more of why I could work certain people and uh, couldn't hear them. And that was my first few QSOs with this system, um, mainly on CW, because JT65 I was relatively new to. I worked, the smallest station I worked on CW was OK1KIR. OK and OK, one CA, and I worked um, some stations on JT65 as well. My first QSO with, was with F2TU, and it always saddens me that he's not so good these days. But um, he was my first, first QSO on CW, and, it, and in fact, I worked him on SSP with this dish. <laughs> so um, that, was, um, that was where I started in, in, in 2010. I put a block of concrete in the back garden, um, I, I, got, I got a pole, I, I got uh, a satellite jack arm, and I took what was a, um, a Clark belt mount, and I modified it after reading Sam Jewell's uh, thing in the uh, gigahertz column. I, I added an extra axis to it and, and turned it, into a, uh, turned it in, into a pole mount. And it worked fine, but I had a lot of problems with it. I, I wasn't happy, um, so it was a case of more power to the monster eagle. Um, is he here today? No. Nope. Oh, what a, what a shame. Um, I, I, I visited my local hardware store because I heard that Michael was going to LY. So I've got to work, work LY. I've worked it on 23, but I've never worked it on, on 13. So I went to my local hardware store and I bought some chicken wire and some canes. So I thought, well, people say, say, well, it's overspill, it's stuff falling off the end of the dish. So I'll put something out to catch it. And as you can see, it's very scientifically calculated and very um, carefully optimized. Um, I basically got four canes, stretched them across, cross addition, tied chicken wire on. And lo and behold, I worked. I worked Michael on JT65C. That was why I was hoping he was here because he's so anti JT65 these days. I actually wanted to uh, embarrass him, but I'm, unfortunately I can't. <laughs> but the problem with dish, with this, is it, it worked, but it had a very low XYL support coefficient. <laughs> <laughs> she saw the, the XSC, as I told you. Oh, right, OK, XSC, OK, XSC. Unfortunately, um, that wasn't very, very popular. She, she said, I can just about, about live with a white dish, but I'm not having something with canes and chicken wire in my back garden. So that had to go, but I did work, Michael. But I did prove another thing, that I had a problem with overspill, and the dish was too small, and the feed was, was, was the wrong shape. So, back to the drawing board. Um, I thought, well, what can I do? I've already got a top-notch preamp. I'm a very good, good friend of Sam's, and he only lives uh, uh, an hour's drive from me. Uh, so I've got a VLNA 13 with sub 0.4 dB noise figure, set up by Sam himself, which is the uh, gold standard. I had plenty of power, at least 200 watts. So there's only really one answer, 
um, in this stage. And I like to misquote the scene in Jaws where Chief Brody's throwing stuff over the side of the he's throwing over the side uh, uh, side of the boat, and it, and he says, "I think you're going to need a bigger dish." <laughs> so I went. I looked around and I thought, well, I've not got the mechanical skills to make one. Um, I have a bit of spare cash, so I splashed it on, on this thing. This is an RF hand design dish from our friends in the Netherlands. Um, took me um, about a week and two bottles of hand cream to build, uh, uh, putting all the mesh down. And um, I finally got it finished. And initially, I started off with um, just uh, GS, GS 500 rotator, the azimuth and elevation, the cheap Yesu ones. And this wonderful counterbalance, which consists of two pieces of angle iron and a sledgehammer head. As you can see, I'm a real purist when it comes to uh, mechanical engineering. So I got this bigger dish. I, I used the same mount. And I use this this uh, uh, rotator. How big is it? <coughs> this is 1.9 meters. So by most people's standards, this is still a very small dish. Some guys guys have these on the top of 60 foot towers and use them for tropo. But you can probably see the edge of my garden is that silver birch. So I don't really want anything bigger. Um, so so I thought I've got that, but I've got a lot of things I need I need to improve. Initially, with the small dish, I got better reports than I sent, so I updated with this dish. Um, I sneaked this transparent mesh, mesh, dish, mesh dish into my garden. My wife sort of, sort of saw it and went. Um, and I thought, well, I'll try and improve the feed. Actually, on an aside, you saw the presentation this morning by by um, the guy with 128 element array. I, I got a very funny tweet from uh, Gavin and one BXF a couple of days ago. It, it was a picture of Dubus with, with, with that antenna on the front. And stuck to the front of this antenna was a post-it note from his wife. And it had three words on it. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you follow me on Twitter, you... you you can see that, but for, fortunately my wife said, okay, go on, it's better than him, um, him being a pest, so I'll, um, I'll let him do it. So, I thought, okay, I, I, I've got a bigger dish, obviously I need to mess around with the choke ring, ring, ring to try and improve it. The other thing, the thing I needed to do was, um, I very quickly came to the conclusion that, that the AC rate rotator really wasn't good enough, and my previous thing, I had to actually track the moon by pressing a button, which if you can't hear moon noise, which you can't on this system, is quite difficult. You have to hope somebody's going to be on so you can track, uh, uh, track the moon. So I need a better rotator. And I also thought, well, let's have a listen on 2304 and listen to our American friends. So these are the various thing, things I planned. So. I thought, well, let's think about setting the dish up. I don't really need to go through this with you guys. You know these things. I need to tune up the feed for the best, best BSWR in isolation. I need to optimize the preamp. I've sort of done that. I need to optimize the dish and the feed with, with uh, sun to cold sky. And I need to find the best position of the feed in my dish that gives that. And again, I spoke to people like Peter and Sam and, and they said, well, it's all about adjusting the choke ring, ring position of the dish, and you move it, and you look at some noise, and you try it, and you adjust the, the uh, dimensions to suit. So I googled, and every time I google anything to do with, with microwaves, he comes up. <laughs> <laughs> I found Paul's excellent paper on septum feeds, and it was exactly what I wanted to know. Opti um, enhancing the OK1 DFC square septum with a choke ring. And I found it, and I looked at it, and I found this lovely diagram. And my dish is 0.35 F over D, so it's not far off there. And then I looked at that, and it's a 20 lambda dish. I thought, ah, that's got to be important. So I thought, well, what do I do now? I haven't got the software. Um, 
So I emailed Paul. Yeah. And within 24 hours, he'd rerun the simulation for me and sent me this, which was a, which was a thing uh, for my dish. A simulation for my exact dish size and type of feed. So I've just got to say again, don't you just love this hobby? Where else can you, for nothing, send an email to one person you don't know that well, and, and within 10 minutes they've, they've done a thousand quid's worth of work for you? Which, which is what a consultant would charge. So I now had a position, a size, and everything else for the choke ring for my dish, and um, I could try it. So I, so I made, up, made up the choke ring, got some, got some copper plate, plate and made up a ring, adjusted it with some to cold sky, <laughs> and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't find a better position that Paul said, than that Paul said it should be at. So, and there it stayed. So now I have this as a feed system. Um, this, you can see, this is, this is early days, single band feed, just a square cage uh, feed. And this box there <coughs> is all the RF stuff bolted to the wall. Uh, keen people who are amongst you may have noticed one flare, uh, one flaw in my EME system. And that's, there's a huge brick wall behind it. So any overspill I get, I have a vertical 293 uh, Kelvin noise source behind it. But again, I'm limited by my QTH. I can't, I can't put it anywhere else. Um, so I just have to live with it, it, it and work around it. So I could go back to the uh, clockwork parlor motor. And that's just a quick sketch, sketch of the mods that I did to the to the thing. It's cheap and simple, but if you can't see, see moon noise, you don't have a starting place, and it's, it, it proved difficult. So I reached into my wallet again, I'm afraid, and I bought, um, I bought a speed RAS. Um, there, was, there was computerized tracking support for it. I bought, bought the one, one with the standard sensors on it, um, but very quickly again, I came to the conclusion that the, the, the one degree encoder wasn't going to be any good above, much above 13 sems, even with this small dish. But I did now get uh, typically 8 dB sun, sun to cold sky in those days of high solar flux. I could see uh, echoes very easily on WSJT mode, somewhere between minus 20 and minus 23. So I was fairly happy with that, and I worked people. I had a lot more QSOs. I worked quite a few people on, uh, on, on, on SSB. And these are the sort of results I, I, I was getting with this new system. I could easily work 2.4 meter stations on JT. I could work three and a half meters up, I, I could make CW stations. But I was always a few dB short of easy QSOs. But you know, let's face it, if you want easy QSOs, go on 40. <laughs> um, so I, I did fairly well there, I was quite, quite happy with that. So I thought, right, well 13 is boring now, I've done it, I, I've worked everybody, let's try something else. So onwards and downwards, <laughs> I thought let's try 23 stems because that's where the activity is. I found I'd worked a lot of the big t dish stations on 13, so I decided to go down to 23 stems and everybody said, you must be mad, 1.9 metre dish, you must be mad. But I discovered this marvellous thing called the SM6 FHZ patch feed, <coughs> which is the size, which is the diameter of my 13 cm feed, and works extremely well. So I got myself a hybrid. I had about 160 to start with, and then up to 250, and I, I, I made it work. And so far, I've done it worked on continents, and Australia was through a tree. I've had 30 CW initials, 105 all mode initials. That's just with, with that setup with the patch. So I thought, ah, bored with that one now. It was hard work. Anybody who's tried to work me on, on 23 on CW, it's, it's quite difficult, but I have worked most of the people with anything above about uh, uh, three meters. So I thought onwards and upwards then. And I said, I know, I'll try six sems. And they all said, six millimeter mesh? You're mad. <laughs> but so, they were absolutely right. I tried it briefly. 
uh, and then I gave the or uh, sold the equipment to uh, PI9 Cam and went and did something else. But I have come back to it, and eventually I decided it was time to remesh the dish with 2.4 millimeter mesh. So another two days and two jars of hand cream later, I then had a dish with 0.9 uh, uh, with with 2.4 uh, mesh. I, I made myself a reasonable LNA from a Franco board, uh, a couple of Ferranti PAs. Uh, Peter very kindly lent me an RA3 EQ feed. RA3 AQ, I'm sorry. Um, and I was on six sims. And so far I've got 13 R mode, mode initials and two CW initials. But I've not been on the air since about, about, about July, but I'll be back. It wasn't really performing as well as I expected. The sun and the moon noise figures were not as good as anything like um, the VK3 uh, 3UN prediction. So I suspected a dish accuracy and I needed to improve the pointing accuracy. So what I did last year was I upgraded the SPID with 0.1 dB absolute sensors by, uh, from our friend in Germany. And I'm going to run through this very quickly, but there seems to be a lot of interest in this, so I'm hoping to write something for Dubus with a bit more detail. But the, uh, the ideas for Azimuth were based on the work of DJ5AR and a few others. So what I did was, if you know the SPID, you will know that it's, this is the bottom of it, and it has a large tube which slides over the top of your thing, and you have six, eight bolts to hold it. So what I've done is I've run a shaft down the centre of that and that attaches to the body of the spit. Don't make, make, make the mistake I made at first because I had a, inside the spit there's like a car wheel bearing. And I thought, oh this is easy. All I need to do is put an expansion bolt into, this, into the centre of this bearing, tighten it up and as the bearing rotates it will rotate take the shaft. And I felt so clever about that until I switched it on. <laughs> and I started tracking and nothing happened. And then, then it suddenly dawned on me, with a car, with a car wheel bearing, the uh, centre rotates yeah. and the outside stays steady. Yeah. With the spid, the outside rotates and the centre stays uh, steady. Yeah. So right, I have to go back again. So I, I came up with this idea, what Andreas and his friends did, where they stripped the whole thing out, unpressed the bearings, and I thought, I'm not going to do that. How can I circle this shaft down the centre so I, I can attach it to that? So I came up with a very simple plate, and this is looking into the top of the spit. Um, all I did, did was I took a square plate, the, f the bottom of the three holes is tapped, and they are just blank holes and I drilled very carefully two holes in, in the base of the spit and, and used self-tapping screws. So if you can imagine that plate now sits like that, it's got two screws that go down into the base and it has, has the shaft like that. So as the whole body turns, it turns the shaft. So I just, if you remove the um, stop and you can just about fiddle it down so that it's there and then just bolt the screws in and there it is done. And then you can just put the shaft up, find the thread and, and uh, screw it in. So I did that. So I then had, um, I then put a second tube to, with that shaft, shaft inside, put an end plate, uh, plate on it. And that, this, this lot now goes inside the pole. I've got two holes drilled in the pole to bring the wires out. And that's it. I've now got 0.2 dB uh, sensitivity. For, for elevation, I just added an outrigger on, on to the end shaft, uh, put another of the sensors there, a very carefully designed anti-rain uh, device, and ran them through. So I've now got full azimuth and elevation of 0.2 degrees. So I now had a much better system for the higher bands. Five I have, minutes. Okay. I have better mesh. I had more um, um, accuracy, so I thought, right, here we go then, three sems, why not? And of course, with a mesh dish, you must be mad. I was. 
again, it's not worked very well. Um, I made myself up a three cent fee, um, and I really rapidly come to the conclusion that the actual frame accuracy of this RF hand design dish is not quite right. Um, so either I've got to get another dish, or I have to get get my hammer out and um, uh, try and straighten it. But I was running 12 watts to uh, Kumar feed based on Ingolf's design, but but without the septum. 0.6 dB F1 OPL, F1 OPA LNA, and I've worked two people. I was really ch uh, chuffed about that. But let's face it, it's a start, and it's really not working as well, well as expected. But I have now done five bands, and, and I think that's, that's pretty good in seven years. So finally I thought, right, back down again, we'll try nine cents. I just happened to mention to PA7JB that I'd love him to build me a feed, and then, and then went. And he turned up at Marklesham with one. I thought, oh, what a fine chap. <laughs> so I've, I've got a 40 watt Toshiba, um, a VLA9, and after just one weekend of operating, I, I managed to work four people. Um, so that was band, band number five. So I felt I'd sort of done it. I've got plans, plans, I have a second Toshiba amp. If somebody can find me a device, an output device for it, I'll put that in, but it's blown up, unfortunately. Um, very quickly, because I'm running out of, out of time, this is how I've got the uh, uh, dish feeds arranged. For, tw uh, for 23, 13 and 9, I've got a 150, 150 millimeter square box, and the feeds just, just poke out to the end. The preamps are in there, and there's a single feed for the power. Um, for six and nine, I've built the uh, transverters. That's three cent with a single 12 watt amp. This is the 24 with two Ferranti amps in it. And that, that's the heaviest of all the feed boxes. Uh, but again, I, I can now just slide them into the dish, set, set them up on markers, and, uh, and off I go. Um, so you, you can see the arrangement there. And for 23, that's the uh, patch feed. So you can see they're all very similar sizes. I've got standard plugs and sockets, so I can do a band change in about 10 minutes. So, there you have it. Five band DME. I'm not going to win contests. <laughs> I'm not going to work all the DA expeditions. I'm only going to do, do SSP with big guns, but I have worked a number of people on SSP. And every one of them says, what? How big? <laughs> Um, but I'm certainly learning that and I'm having great fun, so I'm enjoying my hobby. So a few acknowledgements. Uh, I'm referred to as a radio nerd by my wife, but, but she tolerates me. Sam was the guy that was responsible for getting me interested in the first place. Peter and I had endless email exchanges with him. He, keep, he keeps sending me bits of hardware. It happened again this morning. I said, I want to measure the dish. And he said, "Oh, I've got a, I've got a laser bottle that you can, I've got a laser thing that you can borrow." And John, for his peerless mechanical engineers, and others too numerous to mention. Thank you. Thank you, John. Maybe there's, you have one minute for one question. Nobody dares. <laughs> Okay, you were very clear. <laughs> Thank you very much. I won't do I won't do a brown and walk away with the microphone and abuse somebody while I'm walking away. <laughs>